Week seven, segmentation, targeting, positioning. This is where we get into the real heart of marketing's applied practice. All of marketing is predicated on the idea that there is a customer, that you have an offering that has value for that customer. Now to make this work on a practical level is that we can't offer everything to everyone. So instead we prioritize in terms of who will be most responsive to our targeted offer and who will get the most benefit from our targeted value offering. In this, we use the three ideas of segmentation, targeting, and positioning to create an environment that allows us to be precise in our offer and to address that offer to the people who we think are most interested because we've got limited resources, we can't access everyone, and not everyone's going to be interested in the offering we put out into the market. So let's break down some of the key concepts across the three areas. Segmentation is the idea of taking an overarching market, dividing it and subdividing it until you have multiple possible choices. The idea at the segmentation level is that you want to have options. You want to have many options. The more nuanced your segment, the more differentiation you can get between segments, the easier it is then to go and activate a targeting strategy. And the idea behind targeting is that you take one of the segments as your first port of call. So you start with this segment, you target this segment, you put your resources, your effort and your energy into addressing that segment. And this is the targeting process. As a result of your actions, of your segmentation and your targeting, your value offer is then positioned in the minds of the target market. Positioning comes with a series of deliberate strategies that you can use, but it's also ultimately a question of how does the target market of interest consider your product against all the other alternatives that are around it. So there is a need for this to work, for you to first break up the audience into categories, classifications, frameworks, based on how well you think they will respond to your value offer. Go after specific markets that you think will respond well, and then monitor how you are doing in those marketplaces. How is your positioning in the eyes of the audience comparing to the positioning that you were after? So there's a couple of things we need to talk about. Uh, the first thing, segmentation often drives off the back of demographic breakdown. I have found gender to be an utterly useless construct in the 20-something years I've been a marketing academic. In the papers that I've run, I've had one, maybe two t-tests on gender where I've got a different differentiated result three tops in 20 years of research. I don't find it to be valid because gender is genuinely a social construct and marketers are in the business of making social constructs. Pink was the color for boys until we said pink was the color for girls. Dresses were wore, uh, the appropriate attire for young men until we decided that they weren't. It's a social construct and if you've ever watched a young male get super defensive about his doll collection because they're not dolls, they're action figures, then you understand how you can gender the hell out of something with a label and a brand. So. Gender, it's a social construct. We're in the business of making, dealing, and selling social constructs. 
Some people super need their social construct, some people don't. So as far as a data piece goes, I think it's mostly utterly useless because it's been mostly utterly useless for me. Same goes for age-based cohorts. Now we can talk about Generation Y, Gen X, Baby Boomers, but fundamentally, the reason why I'm Gen X, apparently, by age brackets. And Generation X got the label in 1991. Now, disclaimer, full disclaimer, I like Douglas Copeland's work overall. But when Douglas Copeland wrote a novel called Generation X, Tales for the Accelerated Culture, came out in 91, it was named after the band Generation X, who were from the 1970s, 1980s, fronted by Billy Idol. They themselves were named after a 1965 book based on popular youth culture, which in turn, I believe, was based on a 1950s movie. It was named after that. So the whole slacker culture thing was from a fictional novel written by a baby boomer, inspired by a baby boomer band who were writing books about baby boomer youth. And that then became the definitional generational labeling protocol for Gen Y, Gen Z. <sighs> Look, if you think gender's a good social construct, you should try age brackets. Freaking brilliant, because you can sell enormous amounts of stuff off the back of it. The third thing that's very, very important from my perspective. Market segmentation decisions should be a case of evidence-led decision-making. There's a lot of ideologically driven market segmentation decisions. And the link here is to the idea the Warner Brother Corporation runs a series of cartoon shows and every time their cartoon shows get a strong traction with the wrong demographic, aka the show they wrote for teen boys gets a teen girl audience, they shut the show down rather than sell to the teen girls. That's dumb. That's just straight up stupid. That is leaving money on the table. That is going and setting fire to your wallet and looking surprised when you can't pay at the checkout. It's a dumb decision. It's an ideologically driven decision. Warner Brothers does not want to sell their products to an audience and they will refuse, they would rather not have the product on offer than have it being sold to the wrong, com wrong type of customer. It bothers me. Now, I know one of the things we're going to say in market segmentation is the purpose of segmentation is to actively discriminate. And it is an ethical thing. It is a question of, irrespective of what the outcome of your marketing is, your marketing starts from the point of intentional discrimination. It is just a facet of the way segmentation works that you prioritize someone over someone else. So you have to have your ethics. You have to validate, justify, figure out your ethics are going to come into play here because you are actively discriminating against one group over another. You can't call this neutral. This is proactively prioritizing somebody over someone else. Now what this does allow you to do is that there are points in time where you can go, this offer is not for you. So you can create a movie for a target audience and other target audiences can go, this movie wasn't for me. And your answer is, you're damn right, son. This movie wasn't for you. So everything, it doesn't have to be everything for everyone. That's the other thing is that marketing's fundamental predication is we do not have universal value offers Nothing has inherent merit. You cannot offer something that will satisfy everything to everyone. We start from a position of you need to work out 
who will respond to you the best and work from there. So not everything's for everyone, but also there isn't, at the same time, there's not a universal audience. There's not a perfect first target group. There's not an ideal, oh, you must always address this particular audience. That's not how it works either. Segmentation's idea is map out the audiences. Targeting's idea is pick the one who's going to respond the best to you. Positioning's idea is get in there and be one of their decision choices. So let's kick it off with segmentation. Applied discrimination for profit. It is a multi-step process. You are going to need to work through sequences of ideas. One of the things you will find is that between steps three and step six, it's a loop. That's a really important thing to understand about marketing is it's okay for you to backtrack, reconsider, iterate, do multiple versions, and in particular, when we get around to segmentation, doing frequent drafts, having multiple possible segments, having multiple alternative strategies, that thinking is beneficial. It doesn't go to waste because you, having thought through, who are my top five markets I want to deal with, who's my first priority, then you've got your, who's my second, who's my third, which one am I going for, fourth and fifth? The thinking that you invest early in your segmentation understanding and your use of the technique benefits you in the long run. So one of the things about a segmentation strategy is segmentation is driven by a strategic decision. Now, I'm just picking up the ants off here, and that is the question of, if you are going to use the ants off matrix, you can use it as a segmentation strategy. Your first segmentation question is, do we have an audience? So if you're starting that, do we have an audience? Do we have a market? Yes, we do. Well. Here's a start. You can go market penetration and product development. That's your strategy. Do we have an audience? No. Well, market development, diversification. So market penetration, product development, we have an audience. We want a new audience. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you're going, we don't have an audience, and we just built a new product, diversification means that you need to start, you need to get an audience. That's your, that's your whole segmentation strategy. But also, if you are doing this from the perspective of going, well, we have an audience, we'd like a new one, or we have a product, we've got an existing product, we'd like to find a new audience, or we'd like to figure out how we can get more of what we're doing to the audience we're currently doing. These are all strategic decisions, growth-based strategy decisions that are your starting point. Your segmentation variable toolkit, there are a number. Now, the idea here is that a good segmentation strategy is multifaceted. One variable starts, but it's not the conclusion. <sighs> if it is the conclusion, then it's usually geography, and it's usually international marketing, and it's usually shouting, someone shouting, let's sell to China. And my answer always is, who in China? Who, who, when you say, let's sell to New Zealand. Who in New Zealand? All marketing needs to have a target market. Now, the variables that you have at your disposal here, these are means by which you can divide and subdivide a market to understand more about that audience. From the top of the list, geography is basically a question of distribution. Where are people located? What are the features of the locality? The logistics of selling to a location like Canberra, satellite suburbs with a central CBD district versus selling to Sydney, insular micro suburbs 
far too many city councils, to selling to Brisbane. Retail cluster in with you know, Brisbane has a strong retail cluster in the CBD, uh, with a couple of high retail clusters on the uh, perimeters. Canberra, the centres are sort of similar, but the distribution, you've got to get everything to here first. So geography lets you also do things like consider weather conditions. The geography of Canberra versus the geography of Brisbane versus the geography of Darwin and Hobart. Who's going to need winter clothing for longer? Who's going to be interested in buying summer clothing in ooh, August? Who's going to want to be buying jumpers and heavy jackets in November? So geography is important. But geography in its own right doesn't tell you anything about the people who were there. Demography is the objective. Uh, criterias around things like income, living standards, uh, age, gender, education levels. Again, the challenge here is that demography is a, it's more observable, but less predictive. You start then, uh, things like the Australian Bureau of Statistics have the geodemographics for you. The psychographic profiling is when you're starting to get into people's attitudes, beliefs. Uh, it requires more survey. It requires people to self-identify. It requires a lot of understanding and work. But it's got potency. And you can mask it behind things like, which Harry Potter house are you? Fill out this quiz and we'll identify the type of muffin that you would order for breakfast. So things like the BuzzFeed quizzes and the Facebook quizzes and the Harry Potter quizzes, and fundamentally, if you know which house you are in in Harry Potter, you've already applied segmentation to yourself. And that segmentation is beautifully crude across the psychographic variables because each house is defined by a psychographic trait and it's a four, it's a two by two matrix. It's, in one sense, it's brilliantly brutally functional, but in another sense, it's got the accuracy of a sledgehammer for needlework. So beyond psychographic is the benefit-based. Now, benefit-based segmentation is starting to think more about the value offer, what is in, what does the customer get from using the value offer. The more conversant you are with benefit-based segmentation, the easier it is to create variants on a theme around the value offer. So you're looking at being able to quite easily do your Ansoff expansion because you know what the product is, what the product offers, and you can either increase the offering or variants of the offering to create new products. This is where the if you do benefit-based segmentation and you look at something as functional as the Mars bar, it's a fast-moving consumer good snack food that has a cooking variant, a fun size variant, a family size variant, a giveaway to kids at a party variant, and about three or four different sizes depending on where they're selling it. Oh, and the bundle it with a bottle of Coke in the fridge in the 7-Eleven and the service stations on the highways variant. So it's all about benefit-based segmentation. What, what is someone going to get from using this product? Behavioral segmentation is also around use level, use volume, and there's a lot of stuff uh, around casual users, heavy users, experienced users. So. How frequently is someone consuming the product? How often? Understanding that also then slides you back into some of your Ansoff frameworks. The whole totality of consumer-based uh, marketing, virtually every variable you encounter in consumer behavior is fair game to use for market segmentation. I mean, that's the whole point of consumer behavior is to understand the consumer. So if we understand the consumer does not care for novelty. They like things to be 
as it was, as it was before, as it will be in the future. Then novelty-based segmentation. Strong novelty seeking needs it to be new. Too strong novelty aversion needs it to be as it was before. Novelty seeking is a consumer behavior theory. It sits up in psychographics, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Also, from international business, the Hofstede um, variables, things like power dynamic, any of the stuff that Hofstede talks about can be used for segmentation as a variable. Now, the key to understand this is you want to work with the variables that are going to give you the best return in terms of what is my value offer most likely to need? What am I going to need in terms of understanding my customer based on my value offer. And benefit behavior are super useful. Psychographics hard to get, but brilliant when you've got it. And some of the Hofstede stuff is cliche and stereotypy and suspect, but may also be useful. Now your next step, once you've worked your segmentation variables out, once you've got your data there, is clustering. So segmentation is a clustering process. It's about taking this vibrant, diverse framework of humanity and bring it together into definable elements and aspects. Think of it, if you will, of a deck of shuffled cards. Segmentation lets you sort those cards into a variety of different ways. Now the most obvious one is going to be, if you're going to sort a deck of cards out, you could sort it out into the four different suites. So, you know, hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades, but then you could say, well, we'll sort them into red and black. Then you could go, well, picture cards versus number cards. Or you could take this shuffled deck and go, Let's sort them out in terms of winning hands in Texas Hold'em Poker. Let's sort them out in terms of winning hands in Bridge. Let's sort them out in terms of winning combinations. And then, let's sort them out in terms of, is this your card, card that you've selected earlier? So, understanding that there are a range of different ways in which to create your segments, your purpose here is to give yourself options. You are going to divide up, class, cluster and classify a whole bunch of different categories so that you can make some choices. And the choices are based around your strategy and capacity. So your evaluation, your first, always your first stop is is this an audience who will be receptive to our product? Is this someone who, if you're doing this, and we're gonna focus commercial for a minute here, you're selling a product. Is the person who you are addressing this to going to pay for your product? If they are, then they are receptive, and that's your starting point. How do we get someone to spend money on us? Now, your second question here is a very important question, and this has been the failure of a number of franchises over the years, and a number of Australian franchises who have lost, lost it all because of this. Is this an audience that you can address? Now, the key here is all about capacity. So if we take something like an organic, uh, an organic butchers, they are breeding organic hens, geese, exotic organic um, produce, but it takes time and they have a very low capacity in terms of they are positioned to be expensive because they can only produce four or five units because of the quality of the units are very high, but the units they're outputting is very small. They can't ramp up supply lines by going to non-organic supply. They can't 
create the conditions at scale, which means that they don't want to go for a mass market. That's a bad strategy. You want to be niche, high cost, niche, high price, luxury, low volume, because that's what your capacity is. And this is one of the things, so where it goes wrong for a lot of businesses is the initially, the growth always, if not growing then failing mindset, means that instead of going, are we secure? Are we servicing an audience that is meeting our financial needs? Are we meeting their needs? Is there a balance? If there's a balance, continue on balance. Will growth harm our ability to service our primary audience that's currently keeping us alive and in a job? So the question here is, can you actually expand into that audience? Do you have the capacity? Will the expansion actually cost you in terms of you've got to up the volume, you've got to increase the, uh, you to suddenly start making distribution deals, you've suddenly got additional problems in terms of scale, shipment and all the other things. So it's entirely possible that you could grow yourself out of your, out of profitability, out of success. And a series of Australian franchises have gone down that path because they have expanded past the point at which they can service the markets. And something as basic as pies, pizzas, and donuts, there is a finite demand for those products, and you can grow outside your market. The third question is, if you do want to expand, can you reach this new audience in a feasible and sustainable way? If you start to address this audience, will you retain your current audiences? And this is one of the things, when we start talking about things like the innovation adoption cycle, innovators need things to be new. Once it stops being new, you s the innovators are going to wander off. So you need to get out of the innovator camp or make all of your money from them before the shiny wears off. If it moves from innovators, that moves into early adopters. Early adopters use the product as a means to show that they are fashionable, means to show that they are different from the others. They need it to be a differentiation. If you use the use that as a springboard to get the mass market on board, the early adopters will leave because it no longer differentiates them. So widespread mass adoption could co will cost you your first two target markets. A new product will get innovators. As soon as the innovators are bored with the shiny, they'll move on to something else. You're unlikely to keep an innovator at the same time as you'll have an early majority. Now the early majority market is bigger, it's worth more money perhaps, but the innovator will pay a higher price per unit. So you've got to know whether you've got some feasibility to do. You can't just default your way into thinking, oh, next audience. So a couple of the, uh, the criteria here that I want you to think about, but you're also now starting to cross over this as a, as a marketer, these are things we have to consider. So selection criteria for your audience, is it identifiable? Do you know where to find your audience? So distribution becomes a question. What do we know about them? Can we identify them? Can we target them? Can we position to them? Can we get the value offer to them? Distribution. Sustainable, is the market large enough to keep you afloat for the duration of the campaign? Uh, it's a price and product question. Is the value offer enough for them to buy it once, twice, or repeatedly? Do you need them to buy it once, or do you need them to buy it many times? So short goals and long goals are questions here. Reachable, can you physically access that market that you desire so distribution comes back into the loop. Can the value offer be made available to the audience? 
profitable? Will it cost you more to gain this customer than the customer is worth? If so, do you want to do that? Is there a purpose to that customer that is greater than the customer's direct income? If yes, then they're an investment and a cost. If no, then they're not a good audience. Leverageable. And this is where we talk about the idea of stepping our way through multiple possible markets, multiple segments. Is this audience a means to reach the next one? It may be worth running loss on a highly influential gatekeeper market, but if they endorse this product, then you'll make your money back on the early majority, late majority. Or it could completely fail because the late majority and early majority will expect it to be as relatively cheap for them, aka loss making, as it was for the influencers. So you've got a series of choices and decisions that arise here. The prioritization element, what you're looking at here is sequencing the marketing activity. Now this is the same market split that we put up as the hypothetical previously. And the thing about this is um, looking at it from a perspective of it may be tempting to go, oh, we could take markets A, B, and C, because they're all green. It's like, yeah, could. Similar needs and wants, but they're going to want different sizes and shapes, so you've got to scale up. Do we have the resources to scale up? Can we manufacture enough content? Can we, uh, this is what we call the Kickstarter curse, that you put a Kickstarter up. Uh, so Kickstarter is a crowdfunding-based platform, quite often used to support new businesses, new ventures, and new products. I've seen more than a few of these where the intent was to produce 100 units of, yeah. someone wants to create some custom, actually, case in point, create some custom cookware. These were sword handle based frying pans. They were going to be custom and bespoke. The guy reckoned he needed about $15,000 to get himself started. He raised a couple of million, and it was a disaster. He was unable to meet supply or demand because what he was selling were handmade objects, and he didn't have the capacity to deliver 150,000 handmade objects. It just wasn't a thing. Had he gone for market E, the premium customer who wanted to pay a high price for something exotic versus markets A to C, the, uh, look, had it come to fruition, 75 bucks for a custom frying pan was pretty good value. It just couldn't come to fruition because he couldn't, didn't have the capacity to deliver. So you want to look at things, you want to look at, recept is the market receptive? But then also you want to look at the sequencing. So market E in this scenario is the innovator. They're receptive, they'll pay a premium, but they'll also tolerate a product that's not quite ready yet. Uh, these are the people who sign up for early access, pay money to be part of the early access and the beta so that they're in a position to influence and contribute their thoughts towards development, but it's not mass market ready. So you get to market D where it's got more polish, it's shinier and exclusivity and early access is valuable. So if we stick with the software and the video games example, market E pays for the uh, early access and market D is all about the closed beta so that they can have some content for their YouTube channel and they've got exclusives. And then markets A to C are all about once it's been endorsed, as IGN gave this, a 9.7. Then they're on board. But they want it in different formats. Some of them want it on the Switch, some of them want it on the Xbox, some of them want PlayStation, some want PC, some want mobile. So you've got 
a sequence and a priority. You don't have to address everyone at once. You don't necessarily even, if you made enough money and you're happy, you could leave after priority one. Now the key is you pick one of these audiences, you pick your priority market, and then you get started. You get your marketing mix underway, you create and communicate, you offer a value to them, and this is where the targeting positioning come in. So you need to exchange and deliver value. The whole point of a segmentation strategy is to create the sequencing of best option, best fit for your product. So phase two is to get into targeting. There are four targeting strategies. There is a fifth business strategy, which isn't a targeting strategy, and I'm just gonna get this over and done with early. Mass marketing is not a targeting strategy. It does not count. Mass marketing is an one thing to everyone. No, not a marketing strategy, not a targeting strategy. It's a business strategy. It's legit to do if you want to do it. It's not a marketing strategy. So a couple of things to consider. Micro, niche, concentrated, and differentiated. Four different ways to engage the marketplace. Niche, the idea behind a niche strategy is that this is driven by user interest. Niche strategies are really good to be focused around, say, benefits. Also, niches can be sustained. You don't have to expand beyond your niche market. You can cheerfully service a profitable niche market for an extended amount of time. The mere existence of various sports. You've got your mass sports like cricket and soccer, and then you've got equestrian sports, and you've got, sub, you've got like 20 or 30 different equestrian subsports, I swear. You've got the existence of the pentathlon. I mean, the triathlon is weird enough. Ride, swim, run. The pentathlon throws in, you know, sometimes throws in horse riding or shooting or fencing. So let's take runs far. Well, the thing about it from a, a product category as well is so. Tired of just three challenges? Why not add a fourth? Why not add a fifth? Then you get up to the heptathlon and the decathlon and it starts getting silly. But basically the idea on a niche is that you have a value offer that appeals to a small but distinct target market and you address that small but distinct target market and that's all you address. The micro market is a step below or above the niche, depending on how you see it. A micro market is quite often present in a business to business relationship and it's where you only need one or two customers. If you are the accountant for a, well you're the accountant for a celebrity, you may not need a second celebrity. You may find that an accounting, this is how we end up with accounting firms, but you are looking at one audience, maybe two, maybe two people in that audience. But if you've got someone who's paying enough for your services, you don't need a second customer. So micro market is the idea of it being one or two people. Niche market is it being small groups of people or a small group of people. Concentrated is where you start building up multiple markets. You're still very much focused around one of the elements. It's usually benefit based, but where you've got two or three groups of people who are approaching, who have an interest in your product. So if we switch back over to video games for a moment and take something like uh, League of Legends, uh, Overwatch, and similar styles of multiplayer games. You will have a casual gamer who plays it for a bit of fun, a bit of a laugh, catch up with mates. You'll have competitive gamer 
who plays it for the tiers, the achievements, and the levels up. And then you'll have the sports gamer who is in it for the paycheck and the money. Oh, also, you've got YouTube gamer. So those are concentrated markets. It's the same product, they, but you're focused on different benefit sets. And the fourth category is differentiated. So the, the level above this, and if you really think about going around the clock this way, differentiated says that you're at the capacity to deal with multiple possible user groups who have differing and varying demands on your product. This is where you are offering, you, know, you think Coca-Cola runs a differentiated strategy. Pepsi runs a differentiated strategy. They have different sub-products. Uh, within the Pepsi Max line, you have the 2 litre bottle, the 1.25 litre bottle, 600 ml, 375 ml can, 200 ml can, and on tap. Six different products notionally selling you the same liquid. You then see variants within how these products are distributed. If we go back up to the 375 mil can, it's sold in packs of 10, 24, 30, individually in machines and individually off the shelf. Oh, and there's a 390 mil subversion, small version that shows up in 7-Elevens now and then. Differentiation all about understanding your market needs and reaching out to do things around the consumer behavior frameworks around things like purchase context, purchase conditions. The drink you buy in a nightclub versus the same brand and product that you buy because you just grabbed dinner before so the Coke you buy in a nightclub, the Coca-Cola, <laughs> the Coke you buy in a nightclub, the Coca-Cola you buy in a nightclub, the Coca-Cola you buy at uh, Nando's for the dinner, the Coke that you buy out of the vending machine at university, the Coke you buy at Woolworths, the Coke you buy at IGA, the Coke you buy at 7-Eleven. All of them functionally are the same product but all of them have different value offers in different contexts. So a differentiated marketing strategy is about trying to pick up all of those different contexts. Again, being aware of the context changing, changing necessarily the audience, audience needs and wants, and working with that. As I said, it's easy to look at something like Coca-Cola or Pepsi or McDonald's and think, oh, mass marketing, rather than thinking, lots of differentiated. Positioning. All right, the positioning strategy. There are ways inside, and it will come up again in promotion. There's a lot of ways in which uh, the marketing mix enables positioning strategies. The value offer, what the offer is worth, the price tag for your product is a First and foremost, it's a positioning strategy. Do you cost the same as, less than, or greater than your competitive rival in the market? So that's an initial value. That's a position, straight up. Cheaper, more expensive, matching. Product positioning, does the product offer the same set of values? More, less, better, worse. Place, are you available in the same locations as your competitor products? Now you know I've left promotion off the value offer here because it had promotion for positioning, positions around symbols and competition. The message you send, do you actually mention your competitors? There is a messaging strategy that allows you to put your value offer head to head with your opponents. The attributes of your product, the features, positioning based on volume, size, positioning based on location, are you exclusive? Do you have some big lad 
in a suit standing at the door with doing the whole thing and opening a little red rope to let people into your store. Now, I gotta admit, as a marketer, I think it is just magnificent when you're making people queue up at a retail store. It's like you got some big bruiser of a bouncer out of the front of a handbag shop just doing that and your clientele, like he's six foot ten and your clientele, two of them standing on each other's shoulders wouldn't get up to his height. But the exclusivity, the only two people allowed in this store at the one time, I'm thinking, Lord help you if you don't buy something, if the bruiser out the front thinks his job's at stake. But it's the symbolism, it's the way your store, your shop front, your retail shop front communicates. That's a positioning strategy. That says that is a luxury product. They can afford to turn people away from the door. That product's got to be good. Same for symbolism, same in competitors. Competitor-based positioning is really easy. Where are you in terms of price? Where are you in terms of literal physical place? Where do you sit on the shelves compared to your competitors? Who is Positioning came originally from the concept of a shelf full of goods. Who is to these? If you're here, who's here? Now, it's all about the mental space. If I occupy a position in someone's mind as a provider, who's either side? So one of the things about positioning theory though, as a marketer, is it's frustrating. You don't get final control. Like with the value offer now, you create a positioning that has potential, but it's the customer who makes up their mind. So you may find that you know, you've been suggesting that you are this low-end, super cheap brand, and your strategy was we're just going to high volume, uh, five bucks a go, just churn through, no quality requirements. And then somebody shows up and your positioning strategy is you're perceived as a bit of a luxury. You're like, you're not priced as a luxury, but a, kind, a certain social group who are known for, well, a, a group of people who you wouldn't want associated with your brand suddenly start overtly wearing your brand as their moniker and their marker and you're sitting there face palming going, yep, there goes my mass market. I can't, with these guys wearing these shoes, I can't get mass appeal. Now there's a brand, because there's one other thing about the positioning that we don't necessarily, well, we may or may not be out of control, and that is positioning based on the consumer who uses your product. Now sure, some of you may be living for the moment um, Kim Kardashian dis discovers your brand. Look, Kadash Incorporated isn't going to discover you without you having done a lot of backroom deals and supply line guarantees and manufacturing guarantees and quality checks. They're an industry and they're a business to business partner. They won't just randomly find you. They will find you, go assess you, judge whether you are commercially worthy, then reach out and make the contractual arrangements. They're a very, very professional, high quality brand. And if you get to work with them, it's worth every hurdle you've got to clear. But similarly, if you were to be, you think about the number of influencer brands that are out there, number of small time, mid tier, mid card influencers, quasi-famous musicians, quasi-famous sports people, quasi-famous actors, artists, producers. They can influence your positioning theory whether you had them in mind or not when you created the original strategy. They can just happen. 
Now the other thing, uh, a positioning map, and we'll get you to play with one of these um, a bit later, is it's a two by two matrix. It comes with a nice little, uh, it's a good way to do semantic differentials. Uh, basically you can do, pick any two variables on the framework that you want to position against and work out where your brand sits. Or you can map the existing market and, market and say, where do I want to target? So if you are going on the old Ansoff attack here and bringing in a new product, you can look for a gap in the market and see whether in fact your audience, would, your audience of interest would respond to it. Again, things like this, a positioning map is done for each of your target segments and each of your audiences of interest. So you're gonna generate a lot of data. You're gonna have this massive amount of data so that when you go to your next audience, you've already started thinking about it. All right, the last, uh, oh, not last, one of the things in here, the idea of the value proposition and positioning based on value. Now right in the center of this is this idea number four, what the competitor offers, what the customer needs and what you offer. Right there is the sour spot where the customer needs it, the competitor offers it and so do you. That's where it's gonna be hardest fought. On this one, you're offering something that the customer needs that you offer and the competitor hasn't got their hands on doing yet, that's a market advantage. This is a market opportunity, number five, where competitor and customer are doing the same thing, you're do effectively doing the same thing here. This can be a way to get rid of customers. This can be if you're using the full uh, GE Finance Matrix strategy thinking and you want to shed a customer is and you're sitting in here, if you can identify the variable that will get rid of that customer to the competitor, slice out that benefit from your product, drop them out. Remembering that not every customer is a good customer, not every customer is a valuable customer. Now it's entirely possible as well to see, you're looking here at uh, the innovators you have a new product. The product's benefit that keeps it here is it's novel. Competitor launches a similar new product. Now you both have a novel thing. Yours is a little bit older. Theirs is a little bit newer. The innovators swing around to number five here and they're off your turf. You don't have to worry about them anymore. Now, the irony, uh, irony situation is number six, where you and your competitor both offer something that the customer just doesn't care about. That says that what you're looking for is to find another customer over here. But that also says if you are in a situation where you're offering something and your competitor is offering it, but it's not valued by your customers, it's quite possible that your market positioning was done on comparative rather than needs base. So You've both created a feature, let's say social media, Twitter and Facebook and the non-linear timeline. Nobody has gone, you know what I need? I need my carefully curated list of friends to be in a randomized order. No, nobody has asked for that, nobody wanted that. Some people have found a benefit, now it exists, but mostly it's sitting up there. You've mimicked your competitor without actually seeing whether your customer wants it. It happens. And the final elements here are this part. You've got a value offer that your customer doesn't care about. You've got elements to your product that you've got in there because you think are important, your customer's not interested in. Your option there is get another customer. Just grab more customers or slice back on the offering. I will say now, as the lecturer for this subject and the way that the subject is designed, I am well aware that we are 
we got more than a number of objects in number three here. But we also have a redundancy system on the grounds of I have a number of features to the subject that are of only any value to one sub-market within the course. Some of the features are of benefit to most of the course. Some of the features are of mandatory to all of the course. Some of the features are of no use whatsoever to anyone in the course, but we had them just in case. So, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. It's a tactic and it's a strategy. But it's also the philosophy at the heart of the marketing way of seeing the world. So when you go into using the marketing mix, what you're interested in doing is creating mix options, creating combinations of marketing mix outcomes per target segment. And knowing your market segment and having a market segment that responds differently to your offer than to the next market segment makes it a lot easier to create custom, to create the value offerings, and to reach out to that group of people to make them feel that your value offer is special to them. Because one of the things, one of the purposes of segmentation, targeting, and positioning is to make life easier for the firm to get positive responses from the audience, but also for the firm to be able to know a small group of people, meet their needs well, in a sustainable, viable format, so that both you, the customer, and now your market partners, your supply chain and your retail chain, benefit in the long term.